Sup everybody, this is Carrick with ACG, and as always, it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Today we're going to look at Injustice 2 by NeverRealm Studios and published by Warner Brothers. Injustice is out May 16th for Xbox One and PS4. Injustice 2, like the title before it, takes an absolutely huge number of superheroes and villains and throws them into a fighting game. To answer the age-old question, can Swamp Thing take down Poison Ivy? Okay, maybe not that question, but others concerning battle's power and who is the coolest codpiece wearing ruffian in the land. Let's see how it did, shall we? As always, if you like the video, eh, maybe subscribe. So here's my review for Injustice 2. Swamp Thing's the coolest dude ever, the closest you're going to get to Tim Curry from Legend as a playable character, and good guys using bar patrons as human missiles. Graphics are up first. You know, I always liked my time with the original game, the idea of spending leisurely days sitting back, treating Batman to a consistent loop of defeat, hoping to drive him even deeper into insanity, but my lord have they upped the game in the sequel. It doesn't matter if it's the new characters, of which there are more than 15, and they usually hit the mark with an attention to detail that may not fit exactly with a lot of fans' interpretation of them exactly, but still show that Never Realms wants to honor the source material. And it's the little polish as well, like when you choose who you want to fight and as the game's loading you have these slow motion battles between the characters, and some of them have in-jokes that play out physically if there is a story between those characters in the comics somewhere. While old standbys get a facelift, literally coming into the new game with a far higher level of detail than the past title. The same goes for the arenas. Again, they're multi-level affairs, going from the subterranean and revisiting Batman's solitary lair to new locations like Gorilla City with its sun-filled square with statues and breakables just asking for players to go feral. Now, the lighting engine here, though, is probably the true star, with characters slowly fading out into the shadows when out of the dynamic lighting and then bathed in alien greens when getting near light sources in Atlantis's lair or wicking through thick fog in Slaughter Swamp. Just incredibly well done lighting, and the layers of intricate little details have also been really improved from the original, including not just the normal interactables, but items moving around at the player's feet and being impacted by their movements and giving off their own colored lighting as well. And that really just lends an air of dynamic feel to the entire game. Now, speaking of that, let's talk about characters and their animations, and of course, special move sets. Despite the fact that no one's ever gonna dare to call the Injustice game smooth, or pretty much any game based around the Mortal Kombat engine and its style, it's true, they aren't. The fighting styles fit the movement type very well, and even harder to nail down characters like, say, the Flash or Cheetah actually translate remarkably well. This is an entire Justice League better, like the squint of Green Arrow as he takes aim in his super move, or the blood fountain of a Red Lantern with its rage and last night's beer mixture of frothy nastiness spewing forth. Now, at 60 frames per second, all the consoles seem to have no trouble hitting that target almost all the time. The PS4 Pro, though, does have a slightly higher resolution, which looks to be around 1440p, and a couple additional effects here and there to make it just a bit smoother looking overall as a package. But none of the versions are a slouch, and once again we have performance that's remarkably similar where it matters. Now sadly, one or two of these newer characters really did not work for me, but that's expected in a game with this many. As a package, Injustice paints a dire but pretty picture of a world at the wrong end of a battle where beans could destroy it by accidentally bumping into a friggin' table. And in the end, it works. Sound, music, and voice. Going to kill them, Damien. Sounds like justice to me. Killing people is injustice. Superman can't see that. He's grieving. He needs time to heal. Yeah, and what if it had been Gotham? If Joker had killed me, your own son. Ready to quit yet? And of course, when it comes to audio category, sound is up first. Now this is mostly excellent from the layers of environmental sounds in each location that really solidify you being at the world's scariest amusement park or neck deep in a swamp where alligators probably wear human boots, but also in the area of options and how they play out on the sound systems with home theater, headphones, and a couple other options, and of course, individual layered sounds that you can adjust their volumes for. Also, this is some next level stereo sound separation, like if your flash decides to spout off a one-liner while tucked against the far left wall, his voice is decidedly canted to that side. It's excellent stuff, and with the environmental sounds mimicking that, it adds a level of immersion that wasn't quite there in the prior title. Sadly, there are two issues. First, some of the new character's special powers don't have as much oomph as you'd expect, and it's not the low end, it's just the overall level of audio that they encompass. It's just noticed on a few of them, but there were times when my attacks landed against an enemy and I kept thinking to myself, no wonder this guy laughed when I walked in. Also, sometimes, despite many different attempts at changing the settings, some of the level interactions, explosions, and impacts didn't actually make a sound when they hit. Now, this was tested on two different systems to verify it was happening, and it was. It's rare, but it's there as a bug. 
Overall, this is excellent, but it's got one or two little issues. Music. This is actually pretty good, from the epic as hell title screen theatrics to the more somber character intros and location-based stingers. Injustice 2 seems to aim for a slightly more somber, but bigger than last time mood, I guess, which means, hey, that horrible thing is even more horrible than you thought moments ago. But it's the use of their momentary bits and audio cues that really has to be applauded here, from the ramp up of two characters getting ready to exit Clash, to the hushed audio when you're at the wrong end of Black Canary's pissed off housewife sonar blast. It is good stuff, if a bit safe, I would say, in the instrument choice and maybe the overall composition. Voice. Here's the thing. I've always found some issue occasionally with the voices in fighting games, whether it be the angsty noise Robin makes, like a teenager getting his first puberty testosterone pump, to various I'm so bad one-liners. This might be the first time I've played a fighting game and left pretty much uniformly impressed by the vocal work. All around, the roster is filled out with some incredible amounts of dialogue, from the splitting trees of the main story's character choices to the witty banter between two new foes in versus mode. That being said, one of the hidden skins and voices is terrible. I'm not going to spoil it here. I mean, it's like you're listening to Beethoven and some asshole recorded me singing Viva Las Vegas over the top of it. I'm not sure what happened, but damn. And on to gameplay, and a bit about the story. So at the end of Injustice 1, we saw Superman imprisoned in technically two worlds at the wrong end of a superhero supervillain clash that left some members dead, some on opposing sides, and others just mysteriously disappearing, like a magical Ted Bundy escaped death and is just Hoover vacuuming them up to his hidden base in the Catskills. Here though, Batman is trying to get Humpty Dumpty back together again, with plans to make people feel safe in the demolished cities that they've left behind, and various splinter groups having risen up in the vacuum left by Superman and his League of Scary Dudes. And of course, all that is a recipe for fighting. And it doesn't matter if I'm wasting enemies with giant logs of Swamp Thing or if I'm vomiting pure hate onto enemies or going old school as Superman. The fighting system here feels, if anything, more responsive than the prior title, and that includes a number of improvements. Changes that include things like scene interaction attacks being blockable sometimes, unless they're the massive ones, where someone grabs like the nearby Dodge Astro van and throws it at your face, or the ability to roll to escape, which adds a completely new element to the gameplay that was missing in the prior title. So at its core, Injustice 2 does feel better than the original. It feels more varied, but it still feels familiar enough for fans of the original to leap into the sweat-soaked jockstrap of their favorite Flash and sprint around the world in record time. Now, that brings us to the gear system that Neverrealms talked about and many people have worried about. Gear drops in various ways, mostly when you achieve some goal, defeat new opponents, and get a new level, and they are all based on the level of which your characters can get to, which is 20. Now, depending on the box type, which goes up to diamond, you can get different gear from common to epic, gear that can be outfitted on the heads, limbs, and body of the characters and have adjustments to the character's strength, defense, health, and ability scores. And to me, this is sort of where Injustice 2 really gets interesting. You won't be changing the base way a character plays. Flash isn't suddenly going to be slow. That'd make no sense. But instead, you get augments for your own weaknesses at the cost of not buffing your own powers if you want, resulting in changing up the effects of the moves in the game versus how they're performed. But more importantly, many times against specific types of opponents, like heroes or villains. It works stunningly well and adds a level of strategy that is undeniable from the very starting. But it goes far farther than that, with the ability to gain more XP, more money for you or your guild, and so forth, all by performing specific gear trait requirements like not dashing in a fight to wearing all of one armor set with massive bonuses. It is very well done stuff, and there is just a ton here. Now, at the cost of special coins, you can also transform any gear in a character to look like other parts. So if you like the look of your level one sports bra of never jiggling plus two, you can make your epic take on the same appearance. Also, older gear that's low level can be leveled up to your current level at the risk of possibly getting a new item that doesn't affect the same attribute. But you can still keep the old one, you just waste that special coin. Additionally, at this time, the amount of drops is incredibly generous with almost every mode dropping items at some point or giving you credits to buy boxes and various ways to augment those payouts with level challenges. It is pretty impressive stuff. Now, source crystals, which you get in the game, but you can also purchase in the store, are only for buying cosmetic items like shaders, which change your core character colors and some premier skins. And I have to say that just by playing the game and buying nothing, I have a large number of these. And at least for now, the rate at which a player just playing can get them seems really fair for the amount of time invested. Now, another mode is multiverse. Once you get to level five, you have the ability to open up these universes and earths, and each one has a number of quests on them with their own text-based storylines and enemy ladders to climb as well as unique modifiers. I entered a world where an evil mastermind was taking apart the earth at the atom level, affecting gravity. Another where pure evil was infecting the world, causing the levels to be on fire and randomly adding new layers of environmental damage. For me, multiverse 
is without a doubt the new meat. I absolutely love online and I love the story mode, but multiverse does something. It just captures my imagination. And since the different universes are popping into and out of existence at random times, you never really know what you're gonna face until you go into that mode and see which multiverse you're gonna get. And they only stick up for a certain amount of time. Now, of course, the question everybody's gonna ask is, is the online mode supported very well? And it is. You have ranked player and private matches, and so far the net code has been excellent with no dropped frames, but we're gonna see how full release hits it. Now, another mode to the sequel is guild mode. Guilds are places where up to 50 players can meet and go into their own guild multiverses, separate from those in the other mode, and battle out with unique enemies, including massive high-level bosses that will require many guild members whittling away at them until their inevitable demise. And guilds offer perks both in guild mode and out, and there's a customization system that allows for different gear in each one of these modes. But sadly, that's gonna confuse folks, I think. If you jump into multiplayer without going in and switching out to the higher level gear, you may wonder why you're doing terribly in single player, or the opposite, if you come from multiplayer and want to play the main story or the online mode. They have some tools here that are good for copying gear, but they aren't as robust as I would like. And I think some people are gonna come in and actually many times enter a battle and forget to equip their stuff. And of course, if you don't want to go online but want to play multiplayer, you can do it local, which is in multiplayer mode. Multiplayer is for doing two things technically. One, fighting your friends locally in both versus and massive tournaments, as well as an AI battle simulator. Now, in the simulator, you gear up your team the same way as others and set them out as defenders. Other players can choose to send their AI opponents to attack you, and you can attack theirs. This does level up your characters, and it does get you some boxes of loot. So it's a smart way to not only get some levels on characters maybe you're not so hot on at first, or to watch them and see them fighting and see if maybe you want to try them out. Now, a bit about game length. The single player is about five to six hours on normal, but hidden in here is something a bit new. You now have the ability in many fights to choose between characters to engage in the fight, as most run in teams of two or three which does change the feel of the game and the initial narrative just a bit, as well as adds to that time frame. It's a small step, but it really solidified a more cohesive structure instead of the typical, hey everyone, now that I've got you gathered here, let's friggin' run off alone to separate parts of the world to fight and get our asses kicked. In many ways, I personally think Injustice 2 reminds me of the older Mortal Kombat titles with their puzzle fighters and their mini kart racers and their adventure title modes. As a package, there is just a boatload here. Fun factor. Yeah, it's a blast, I'm sure you can tell. I love my fighting games, but Injustice 2 does it right when it comes to enjoyment. Not at all stingy with the gear drops, keeping the story changing and flowing in the single player, and seemingly rock solid netcode for now. Also, the game is so chock full of secrets and little asides, it's actually hard to describe easily from abilities unlocking for characters at later levels that can drastically change your playstyle if you want it to, to basically swapping out some of the characters with their comic book alternatives fully voiced by different people. But it's not all perfect. If there's one problem I do have with Injustice, it's that while I felt that Injustice 2's story trumps the original, there were some issues. One, a large number of players, some major, just aren't in the game, and the story feels less rich because of it. The second issue with the story is the ending feels a bit off, and that's all I'm going to say. It wasn't bad, but I feel like there was some opportunity to fatality the ending, but instead they just sort of low-punched it to death. Lastly, there's a lot of gear to mitigate, and there's a lot of characters here, so I'm sure somebody's going to find something to exploit, but I guess in the end, that's a really good problem to have. So as you guys know, I rate games in a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating scale. This is a buy without a doubt. This is more fun than Injustice 1 by a great deal, and there's just more here. In fact, I could see sinking three to four times more hours into this than the original. So I hope you guys liked the review. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Maybe check out Twitter or Patreon. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.